morning. Welcome to Regeneration Church. It is so good to have you guys here in person. Feels like now that we've got the fall going, we've got folks coming back. Uh, we've got some folks back from being ill. Welcome back and, and excited that you guys are here. Welcome online for those of you that can't be with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wrapping up our series, Four Things to Grow Your Faith Today. And today's a big one because uh, it's actually, as Quincy and I, I look back like Quincy's there, as Quincy <laughs> and I have been talking about it, uh, really kind of one of our favorite stories in scripture and what God does, just the miracles that God continues to do and how we can learn from uh, what has happened uh, in, uh, in scripture. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Of course, before we do, we're going to worship God together. So let me open us up in a word of prayer and I'm going to turn it over to our amazing worship team. Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together and lift your name. God, may the praises of your people, as, we, as, as the praises inhabit this place, may your spirit be welcome here. Yes. God, may we feel and sense your presence, that God, our hearts would be open to what you would say to us today, that God, you would uh, touch each of us. You know where we are Jesus. in our lives with where we are with you. And so God, our hope and our prayer is that you will speak to us, that we will feel you, that you, we will grow in our faith and knowledge of you today. So we pray for your anointing on the service, that uh, we love you and commit this moment to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Let's worship God this morning. together. Oh. Lord, just pour your spirit out in this place right now, God. Spirit come, speak revive. 
hearts continue burning For our King is soon returning As we hold to this assurance Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit serve a great God. Amen. Sing out the splendor of the King. The splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice. He rides himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age, age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning. Stop. 
us with all of him. See, he is jealous for me. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden Afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are, and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how He loves us so! Oh, how He loves us! How He loves us so!
recognize how you love us. That God, you have lavished your love upon us, undeserved, we've not earned it. That God, you demonstrated it through your son, his death on the cross, his sacrifice for us. It was because of your love for us. That God, you continue to love us in our frailties, in our faults, in moments when we wander from you in our path of faith. God, you still love us. Your grace and your mercy, God, they're new every morning. We are so grateful, so grateful that you love us. So let us now in this moment with that confession of your love, God, respond to you, to your word, to what you would have to say to us today, that you would challenge our faith, that you would challenge where we are with you, that you would move us from complacency to a deeper understanding and a, and, and a faith walk. So we give you this moment. Use it for your kingdom's sake, for your will's sake, that your will would be done in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you, ladies, for your ministry, your continued ministry to us each and every week. It is so good. I tell you, as I was just there in worship, uh, really overwhelmed with my love for this church. Uh, just God just reminded me how much each one of you mean to me and just the moments that we've had together and where God has continued to lead us. Honestly, let me confess to you, we have a special church. We really do. And uh, that's not an intro into next series, which is a church like no other. That is a what I truly believe, that we have something that people are looking for. And that is a community that cares, that loves, that desires God's goodness. It's not about numbers. It's not about, I don't know. I don't know what other churches are about, but I know what our church is about, you know. And it's about it's about connection, it's about growing in the Lord, it's about learning what God has for us, it's about you finding healing and forgiveness and acceptance and love for God and one another. That's what we're about as a church. And we're named Regeneration Church because it is all about new life. It's new life in Christ. It's a new life for old Christians sometimes. I'm one of them that I'm like, God, thank you so much for Regen and what it means uh, to me personally. So not in my notes, just what God is really laying on my heart. It's just kind of gushing out right now, but uh, just telling you uh, where I am with, with this church. And so by way of segueing into announcements, perfect. Um, you know, we do have a really huge invite a friend day coming up on the 19th. It's in a couple Sundays from now. Other people need what we have. That's why we're doing it. We're not doing it because we love, you know, inflatable bull riding and, uh, you know, ice cream and tailgating. I mean, that's great and all, but that doesn't have eternal value. What does have eternal value is how many people we can get connected to an organization, a church family, really, like ours. And so we're giving all of us a great excuse to invite people here to experience love and connection. That's what it's about. Right? Are you with me on that? Do you understand? Yeah. So the thing is, it doesn't happen by us just posting on Facebook. It really happens by personal invitation. It really does. It really happens because you knock on your neighbor's door and you say, hey, I really would love for you to come and experience what I'm experiencing. And some of us are really good at it, Jenny, and some of us need <laughs> encouragement. And so I want to encourage all of us to be to be like Jenny and just to go, uh, you know, hey, who do I know that needs to be connected, that needs to be loved on, that needs to, and we all know people that are feeling isolated, that are feeling rejected, that are feeling like they don't have a place. And so let, allow God to put that person on your heart and just go invite them. Nobody's offended with an invitation. I'm telling you the truth. They will not be offended by that. In fact, they'll probably be grateful you thought of them. But why are we doing it? We're doing it because we have something special. And the world who is longing for that connection, that love, that acceptance, they need it too. 
So let's all lock arms together. Let's do this big day that we have planned in a couple of weeks. And I think God's going to, it'll honor God. And I think God's going to honor it. And uh, we'll see some amazing things happen. You with me on that? Yes. You with me online? You can thumbs up. Let me know that you're with me. And uh, let's invite some folks. So when you see it pop up on Facebook, just share it. Let us know that you're going. There's a place where you can um, um, RSVP online. So do that as well so that everybody knows we're, we're drawing a crowd. It's, it's huge. So, all right. I guess other announcements. We do have a, a great outreach opportunity this Thursday. Toddy Oaks has their market, and we run the cornhole. So if you want to come on out and sweat a little cornhole moment with us, that's great. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It will be warm, but it's a great moment for us to love on some folks here that uh, don't know that we meet on Sundays and we can invite them to church. It's been really good connections, so come uh, help us with that. A lot of it is just us mingling and, and, and loving on folks. So if you can be out here Thursday, starts at 6. We're out here about 5.30 um, when, it's, when it's really cooled off by then. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> they lie in church. Okay, whatever. Anyway, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about four things that grow your faith. We've talked about a bunch of stuff uh, so far. We've talked about those um, providential relationships, people that God brings into your life. That's just the right person at the right time. Uh, either you can be that person uh, or, or uh, somebody's that person to you. We've talked about those, those private disciplines, the things that we need to do in order for us to, to grow in our faith. Today we're talking about pivotal circumstances. Pivotal circumstances are those moments, those, those things that happen in life that kind of wreck our routine. You know what I'm talking about? It can be an illness, it can be a job thing, it can be a relationship thing. Usually, nine times out of ten, it's not the lottery. Nine times out of ten, it's something bad. You know what I mean? Those faith stretch moments, we don't look at those as positives. We look at those as, ah, God, what are you doing to me? Or when, it, you know, the hits just keep coming. Or when it rains, it pours. Those moments when we think, I am drowning in this, in this situation. And God, it just seems to be getting worse. It's those circumstances, those pivotal circumstances, those foxhole moments where we turn to God and cry out to him, God, I need you. These are the faith-stretching, faith-forming moments. And we are, in those moments, either going to reject God, God, how could you do this to me? Or we're going to embrace God, God, I need you now more than ever. And we're talking about those moments. And I want to challenge you today on how we view these moments. Because these circumstances do not have to be negative. They don't have to be. We don't have to view them as negative. We hear news of an illness or a disease and we think, this is terrible. It's the worst thing that's happened to me. Maybe so. It can be a death in the family. It can be a tragedy. It can be a car wreck, uh, you know, a circumstance that puts somebody in the hospital. C.S. Lewis wrote, you know, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. The Bible says in James chapter 1, consider this passage. It says, consider it a great, a great joy, my brothers, when you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And I think I'll just stop for a second. Consider it a great joy when you're going through difficult times. It is hard. Andrew is absolutely right. Just got over COVID, had like a really bad time of it. And you're like, joy? Probably not first thing you thought. Yay, I can't get out of bed. I mean, we don't normally do that, right? That's not our thing. Hey, hey. <laughs> Some of us enjoy the bed. All right, I get it. But uh, um, we don't normally consider great joy when we have these terrible moments. But the reason why James writes this, he says, I want you to change your thinking. Consider it a joy, because you're not considering it yet. But do that, because the testing of your faith produces endurance. And it says in verse 4, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Listen, I want us to understand, it's usually not a day of discomfort that we consider a trial. A day we can get past. Usually it's a season of pain. 
You understand what I'm saying? God's, I mean, if it's just a day, we're like, man, yesterday was terrible. Huh, but today's better. We're good. Our, is our faith growing at that point? Not usually. Usually that's a moment. That's not producing endurance. Endurance is something you have to go through over a longer period of time. And when you get through it, you look back and that's a thing. That's a moment. That's a deal. So we'd love for it to be a day of discomfort. A season of pain. I was like, hey guys, fall's coming. Fall's pain, pain fall. We're all going to do that. Y'all be like, no, that's terrible. We don't want that. But that's how, how it is when we grow our faith. And so one thing we need to understand that it is a journey. There's usually a beginning and an ending to it. But it's the space in between where God tests and grows our faith. Right? And so that space has to be long enough The Bible says to produce endurance, and endurance has to be complete so that we will be complete. Tell us about complete, Quincy. So, language is a funny thing. Uh, I'm going to use some technical terms here. Uh, If you don't understand them, uh, forgive me. But who here has ever heard of teleology? Say it again. Teleology. No one has. Go on. <laughs> okay. So, teleology is a philosophy of the study of telos. Telos is a Greek word created by Aristotle. Who here has heard of Aristotle? Okay, we, we okay heard everybody yeah, raises yeah. their hands. So, Aristotle said there are four causes, four types of things that create the world, right? Material cause, uh, efficient cause, formal cause, and the final one is called final cause. Final cause is the word teleos. Teleology is the study of teleos. Teleos is the way something is designed to function. It has to do with design, right? So the word teleos is the word translated complete. In this passage. Perfect, in this passage. I'm not just rambling here, there's there's a point, (laughs) right? So... Telios is the way Aristotle designed, said something is designed to function, right? And this is the word used here. So let the testing is designed to work on you. It becomes the efficient cause, back to Aristotle's causes. And then through it, you become designed to do what you're supposed to do, which is bear the image of God and to bear it rightly. So endurance and testing of your faith is what makes you more like God, more like what you're supposed to be, right? More like it brings about who you are supposed to be, who you are designed to be, right? Without that design, without that teleology, we're nothing, right? We're just base animals. It's through the teleology of what God designed us for which is to bear the image of God. But in order to completely bear the image of God, it takes suffering. It takes endurance, right? It's, it's a, basically it's a time period whenever you're like the blacksmith analogy, right? You've got to heat metal up. If you take a piece of metal and you sharpen it, it won't cut or it won't hold an edge for very long. You have to temper it. You temper metal by heating it up to the point where it's, plastic state and then you cool it off really quickly and that hardens it that's called tempering the 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 blade and that's what makes a blade a good blade that's the teleology of the blade is to cut well it has to be beaten it has to be heated it has to be tortured before it can truly become its teleology this is just like humankind we have to go through suffering And that's why James says, count it all joy. Because without that suffering, we'll never truly bear the image of God that we're designed to bear. We will go our own way. It takes that suffering to mold us. It's like a tree. You've got to cut, you've got to prune it. You've got to cut a little bit away in order for it to grow into what it's designed to grow into. So as we look at this passage, this James passage, and it says, endurance must do its complete work. It's got to do what it was designed to do. So you get a a, a test of your faith. You have this trial that you're walking through. And it's got to do its thing so that you build endurance, which has to 
go to its completion. So it's not a day of discomfort. It's a season of pain. So you go through the season so that you can become who God intends for you to be. Your created purpose is born out of these trial moments we go through. That's where God's taking you through this thing so that you can be the person, the man or woman of God, that he has called you to be. So consider it joy. All right, I got fired. Woo-hoo! God, you're doing something in me. Now, joy does not mean fake happy, okay? And that's kind of what I was doing there. Joy means, <laughs> joy means, I can, you know, I can actually um, not be really happy, like, effervescent, and still have joy. It's the recognition of I have the inward uh, confidence that God is doing what only God can do in me. And I can rest in that. I don't have to have anxiety in that. I can rest in that knowing he's going to do something special. All right, we got to move on or we're not going to get there. But in the main passage we're about to read today, which is found in John chapter 11. So if you're taking notes, just jot down all of John chapter 11. It's not that Jesus takes some negative circumstances that just happen to happen. It's like, oh, well, this, well, you know, whatever, and I'm going to teach you more about faith because here's this negative thing I'm going to show you. Like the storm happens, Jesus calms it. He's like, okay, new faith. It's not that. It's something different. Jesus actually manufactures a negative circumstance to teach them something about their faith. Jesus causes, Jesus was part of the problem, so to speak, so to speak. He creates a pivotal negative circumstances and, and in doing so, I believe he's validating the idea that God knows what's happening in your life. God did not miss something, you know, like he's sort of the backstop and one got behind him. And he's like, ah, well, it's going to be bad for you. Sorry, I missed it. That's not the thing. Jesus actually is creating a negative circumstance here so that he can grow the faith of the people that are following him. So let's read about it in John chapter 11. It says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus, from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So a man was sick. His name's Lazarus. And he has two sisters, okay? And so it says, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. So Jesus has a relationship with these people. It's not like a stranger you know, we're, we're a little more connected with folks, right, when we know them. It's like, oh, hey, my, you tell me pray for my uncle. I'll pray for your uncle, but I don't know your uncle, right, that type of thing. Do you not care about everybody's uncle? You know what I mean. Give me a break. All right, so, um, but Jesus knew these people, and it says he cared for them. And they're like, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness, he's making a declarative statement. He's already telling everybody what's going to happen. He's like, relax. This sickness will not end in death. But it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So verse 4 is pretty important because Jesus is going to do something here. It says, now, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Um, something, I'm not jiving here. All right, so Jesus, you love him. You love Mary, you love Martha, and you love Lazarus, and you heard he's sick. Why are you hanging out for two more days? Write this down. First thing you need to understand is God is in control. And we say this all the time in church, but when we get out there in the world and bad things happen, and we're like, ah, Lord, are you really in control? This negative relationship moment happened. My kids, my job, my finances, my health, all these things. And we're like, God, do you... Are you even paying attention? And we talked about it, we talked about it this morning. Sometimes we put human responses on God. They're not really his responses. Where we're like, God's like, really? You're going to say that? And I, I, God's way more patient than that. And he doesn't roll his eyes at us when we're like, God, are you even paying attention? But yeah, he's paying attention. God is in control. Can I get an amen on that? Do you really believe that, though? We need to understand God is in control. Jesus here is creating a brand new category. He's saying sickness can bring glory to God. This wasn't this moment where, you know, somebody did something great and, you know, he's like, oh, I just want to give God the glory like you see the athletes this past weekend, you know, they score the touchdown. They're like, oh, I just want to give God the glory for that. No, no, no. This is, I'm, sickness is going to bring glory to God. This is an illness where the sisters were really concerned 
Jesus, you don't understand. Lazarus is on his deathbed. He's going to die. Please come. And so he, he stayed two more days in the place where he was, even though he loved these people. God is in control. Also, the disciples weren't wanting to go back to Bethany. In, in, in continuing in verse 7, it says, Then after that, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. So two more days, he's like, All right, well, let's go. Rabbi, the disciples told him, Just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going to go there again? You're going there again? He says, Aren't there 12 hours in a day? Jesus answered, If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of the world. If anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this and he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Now, Jesus is using euphemism here. You know, he already knows that, it's not, that, that Lazarus has died. He already knows it, even though nobody told him. He's like, no, he's falling asleep, and I'm going to go wake him up. And if you're the disciples, and they always seem like they walked around with some confusion on their faces, like, well, can't somebody else wake him up? I mean, you know, can somebody else not shake this guy? Why do you have to be the one to do it? But he's, again, speaking that way. It says, Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. You guys are never getting it. I'm going to have to tell you, speak really plainly, he's died. But look at verse 15. He says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. That so that is actually one word in the Greek. So you know some Greek. I'm going to throw down some Greek. Uh, it's called the henos clause or the hena clause. And it means that so that means there is a purpose for what is happening here. When you see that in the Greek, it means this is here, this thing that is happening is for a purpose. And so he says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there for the purpose that you may believe, but let us go to him. So it means it was intentional. So as soon as Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give of you. And your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. How many of us in a moment where suffering happens and we blame God? Right? Like here, if you had been here, this is her retort. This is her blaming Jesus. This is your fault. He died because you weren't here. Right? That seems to be the natural human reaction to us, like to what we think whenever suffering happens. We're like, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? But, you know, forgetting that pruning the tree analogy, maybe whatever's happening is strengthening you in some manner. Um, so don't worry, we will see him again someday, is what Jesus tells, tells her. Or, no. That's what she said to him. Yeah. Um, in Greek, there's no separate word for faith, belief, trust. These are all synonymous terms, right? So when you believe in God, when you believe in Jesus, you're trusting him, right? We have this, we have these different concepts of belief, faith, and trust, like they're different, like separate things. But in the Greek and in Hebrew, in the ancients, they're synonymous. If you believe God, you trust God. If you're believing Jesus, you're trusting Jesus. Um, so again, in John 11, verse 32, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, he would not have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was angry and his spirit was deeply moved. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. And Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the Bible. And Kevin and I actually have different... Uh, we disagree on this one. Di different me like, understandings of what Jesus was weeping for. Uh, I personally do not believe that Jesus was saddened by the death of Lazarus because he's about to raise Lazarus. He's not, like, it's not going to catch him by surprise. 
I think he was really upset at their lack of faith, at the fact that they did not trust him. Uh, you want to? Sure. Um, go I, ahead. I, I view it a little bit differently. And, and there's, you know, so one thing you need to understand about the Bible is we kind of all come from different perspectives. And there are some things that are pretty much this is what it means. And there are other moments where God gives us some room for interpretation. And this is one of those times. And it doesn't mean we're not brothers. It doesn't mean we've split the church. It's okay it to be wrong. It just means that, you know, it's, you're right. It is okay if you're wrong. So anyway, um, uh, but I believe in this particular passage, I believe that they separate the two things because he said he was angry and deeply moved. And I believe those to be two different things. And so I believe that Jesus was connecting with what they were feeling, that the sorrow that they were feeling, it wasn't, he knew that he was going to resurrect Lazarus, of course. But I don't know if you've ever been with people who are, see, this calls for empathy. It's a word I'll tell you about. You don't know what it means. I but uh, uh, but he, was, he, was, <laughs> he was empathizing. I believe Jesus was empathizing with the people that were there, and he was connecting with that emotion of loss. And uh, so I think, it, I think it's a little bit different. But go ahead. Keep going. So uh, even though I prefer apathy, <laughs> I will okay. accept empathy. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, God knows and understands and feels your pain. He empathizes. He has experienced it. He's lived it and he felt it. John Lennox said in his latest book, Christianity claims that the man Jesus Christ is God incarnate. The creator had become human. At the heart of this message is the death of Jesus Christ on a cross just outside of Jerusalem. The question at once arises, if he is God incarnate, what is he doing on the cross? Well, at the very least, it means that God has not remained distant from human pain and suffering, but that he himself has experienced it. Whenever you're blaming God for your pain and suffering, just think about the pain and suffering that we inflicted on Jesus. Pain and suffering that he took to bear your sins. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize See, that's another form of that word, empathize. There's mm -hmm. empathize, sympathize, and apathy. Mm -hmm. uh, I still prefer apathy. But Jesus is not unable to sympathize with our weakness. But one who has been tested in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Whenever you suffer and we think, you know, God, why did you let this happen to us? Why did you allow this? Well, I mean, look what happened to Jesus. In some strange way, Jesus uses suffering to redeem the world, hmm. right? And in some sense, he redeemed us through suffering, but in some sense, he also redeemed suffering. And that suffering itself no longer becomes meaningless or pointless, hmm. but it becomes designed, a teleology, a purposeful thing to help you become more like him. Man, that may be, I'm going to just throw this out there, that may be one of the most important things that you've said um, in our times together, that, that Jesus somehow has redeemed suffering. I think that that is absolutely a fantastic thought and, and one we should hang on to. Think about that for a minute. That is extraordinarily profound as we think about God being in control, God using the things in your life. Whatever you and I are going through right now, God knows it and maybe even has designed it so that we can become like Christ, so we can become complete in our faith and trust in him. That's huge. Continuing, John eleven thirty six, 36, it says, So the Jews who saw him crying, saw him weeping, said, See how he loved him. So they probably got it wrong too. So there's three different opinions there. And anyway, um, but verse 37 says, But some of them said, Couldn't he have opened the blind man? Couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? So you had two people that are like, well, he loved him, and then maybe he didn't love him. So a uh, point I want to make on this as we get to this point is faith, write this down, can be strengthened or destroyed by the people around us. you got to really be careful about the folks that you're listening to as you're on your suffering faith journey in these moments. Some people will tell you, well, is it, how can you love God when he's caused you to go through this illness, this sickness? How can you believe in a God who would cause this pain in your life? I mean, if God really loves you, why would you go, be going through this difficult time? I mean, I have hate, we heard this before? This I is, this is that. This I is the chief objection of atheists. It really is. And one that we need to respond to with, God sometimes allows these moments in our lives so that I can become more like Christ. And they don't understand it. They don't have faith in God. I get it. 
um, but faith can be strengthened or destroyed by the people around us is one of those things that who's in your ear? Who is your, your confidant? Who are you trusting that, that other voice in your life? Are they going to be somebody that's going to be building up your faith or someone that's going to be destroying your faith? That's really important. It really is important. And it's often um, your faith struggle and where you find, are you leaning into God or leaning away from him? Oftentimes that swing vote sort of is that person that's with you or the people you're surrounding yourself with. And, it, you know, so... Um, just recognize that. So continuing on, it says, Then Jesus, angry in himself again, came to the tomb. Now, we talked about this. It doesn't mean that Jesus was angry at himself. It means that he was upset that the people around him were not demonstrating faith. He's like, I have told you before we even came here, it wasn't going to end in death. Even though I knew he died, I told you he was dead, but that he wasn't going to end in death, that this sickness was going to bring glory to God. I came to you, Mary, Martha, and I told you, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. And yet you're still going, oh, he's dead. Oh, you people. As a pastor, yes, as a pastor... I get it. Anyway, so um, <laughs> so it uh, said he, was, he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. So that was a common practice in that time. They didn't bury him in the ground, but they would put them in crevices in the rocks. And, you know, they had these places hollowed out, and they would put a stone in front of them, same as how Jesus was buried. He says in verse 39, remove the stone, Jesus said. Mary, always the practical one, and the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, <clears throat> he's already decaying. It's been four days. Um, and so what he's saying is like, yeah, it's, uh, he's gonna, it's not good, man. Don't do this. This is going to be gross. And he's already, there's going to be a stench and an odor and he's not looking good. And so Jesus said to her, verse 40, didn't I tell you that if you believed, trusted, you would see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I say this so they may believe you sent me. So Jesus is saying, this is about me and God. This is about who you, who you are, who I am in this moment. And I'm declaring this so that everybody around me knows what I'm talking about. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Called him by name. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips, with his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. So imagine being in this moment, how crazy this must have been. He rolled away the stone. Everybody's like, it's going to be bad. He rolls away the stone, calls the man's name. And everybody's like peering in the darkness. And they kind of hear some stuff. And then here comes Lazarus. You know, <laughs> can't see. Help me. You know, <laughs> he's like... Uh, and, 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 I wonder if the cloth still smelled. I don't know, you know, but he's like, guys, set him free. So they go over there, and they're probably expecting a ghost or something, you know, zombie-looking thing. And it's just, he's like, it's me, guys. It's me. And, there, and it says in verse 45, look at this. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. They saw what he did. They believed in him. Here's the thing. Write this down. God uses pivotal circumstances to change us. Are you going through a difficult time right now? It's because God wants to change who you are. You're either going to allow God to change you into the person he wants you to be, or you're going to turn away from God, and you're going to become a different person in a bad way. I've seen it so many times that those who turn their backs on God during these difficult moments become bitter, angry, resentful. They become short-tempered. They become uh, these negative kind of emotional vampire people that, man, they're never happy. And, and uh, boy, they went through some tough time. We got to give them some understanding. Yeah, we understand it. But they're allowing those circumstances to embitter them, not embitter them. And we need to really recognize that God puts these difficult moments. And I mean, I know the room. I know you guys. I know the difficult. You have shared with me, and I thank you for it, terrible moments that you guys have gone through. And we can either allow those moments 
to be moments where God heals us, where God strengthens our faith, where God changes us so that we can, we can walk in the glory of God with lights shining bright or we can allow those moments to dim our light to cause people to not even want to be around us anymore where God uses where where we've rejected God to use this in our lives and now we have this tragedy that defines us rather than our faith so in in apologetics and in dealing with atheists uh, you find one common core thing with atheists, and it's always suffering. It's always, they, they buck God because of suffering, because, to, you know, to them it's meaningless. Uh, you know, the famed Epicurus, uh, believe it or not, Epicurus is actually mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Acts, uh, or rather his philosophy, the Epicureans, on uh, Acts chapter 17 um, they're one of the groups of people that Paul is speaking to on Mars Hill or the Areopagus. But Epicurus's argument against God uh, was basically based off of suffering. If there's suffering, then God either has to be malevolent or weak. That was his argument. Because if God couldn't be all powerful and all loving, if there's suffering, that's, that's the spirit core you know piece of atheism atheists don't reject god because of a true lack of belief they they reject god because they're hurt something happened to them and if you can talk to them down the line most all of them uh will tell you that something happened i grew up in church then this happened now i'm an atheist you know but what logic is that like where's the logic in uh you know, somebody at my church was mean to me. Now I don't believe in God. It's just not there. That's an emotional plea. Hence why I like apathy. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, that's, it's, it's a true thing. It's a true thing to state that it's emotions and suffering that typically drive people away from God. And so we have to reinterpret these emotions, these, this suffering without emotion and look at it from the perspective of God working on us. And when we do that, then we, we see great things. We see Lazarus come forth. We see our lives change. We see, you know, evil things become good things because of the grace of God. And it's all through reinterpreting how we view suffering. So recognizing that Jesus actually created this moment I think helps free us from the idea that God has abandoned us, that God has forgotten us, that God has lost something in the mix and we're suffering because we are, you know, uh, cursed or that we are forgotten or we are forsaken. Not at all the case. Jesus loved Lazarus, allowed him to die so that he could bring everyone's faith, including Lazarus. Hey, guess what? Lazarus was not eternal at this point. Do you know that there also came another moment where Lazarus died again? The Bible doesn't say, and he's still with us. We're all terminal. We all have a moment where we, you know, um, we're going to stand before our creator. But the reality is God, Jesus used this even most painful, difficult moment to grow the faith of the people who were experiencing it. He okay. uses these moments, these pivotal circumstances to change us. Um, Philip Yancey said, there's only one thing worse than disappointment with God, and that's disappointment without God. We need to recognize that God uses difficult moments to grow our faith. Pain and suffering are not the exception to the rule of life. Like, like, um, only evil people deserve it, and so they're the only people that get it, okay? That's not how pain works. Pain and suffering, it's a common feature of life. It is because of sin in this world. God one day will do away with it entirely, but until he chooses to do that, he will use it as that agent of change to complete us, as the Bible says. So the choice becomes for each of us. It becomes this. Listen, how am I going to respond? 
How am I going to respond? Let's pray. Father, thank you for thank you for this moment in scripture that you've given us. That you saw fit to allow this one that you loved, where you could have gone and easily healed him, you chose not to because you were demonstrating that you are the resurrection and the life that you are the author of life, that you are the author of eternal life, that without you we have no resurrection. We would not have known that without this moment. But Jesus, you saw fit to teach those Jews that were there as witnesses and also that we can bear witness to this through Scripture. And so, Jesus, thank you. And God, we can, as a sacrifice of thanks, thank you for the difficulties that you allow us, that you trust us with. That there are seasons of pain that we walk through, that we walk through with you so that we are refined by fire, so that we are tested, that our faith builds endurance so that we can be complete in our faith and be the men and women of God that you are shaping, molding, creating us to be. It's not done without the fire. That's not done without the suffering. And as much as we would like for that to be different, until Jesus, you return, that's how it is. And so we embrace it and we consider it. We change our thinking. We consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds, knowing that you're using in our lives to make us more like you. God, I pray for those that are in this room, that are listening online, that are going through those difficult times. God, it can be seasons of loneliness. It can be seasons of financial trouble. It can be seasons of being out of work, being in poor health. It can be seasons where we are just worried and anxious for loved ones, just like Mary and Martha were. God, whatever the season is, you know it. Perhaps even orchestrating it and trusting us with it so that we can be more like Jesus. We can be more like you. So we can be completed in our faith. Lord, that changes everything. When we see those dark clouds start to build on the horizon, we don't have to fear, but rather we can walk in faith. We don't have to live in anxiety, but God, we can live in peace. So God, help us today. Whatever the situation is for each one in the room, God, can we just lay it on the altar? And can we confess that we trust in you? (coughs) Confess our belief and trust. Jesus, you said, didn't I say if you believe in me that you would see the glory of God? So just by way of invitation, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let me just speak to your heart right now. Let me speak to you. You know what you're going through. God knows what you're going through. I want to challenge you to pray this prayer. Just pray this in your, not out loud, but just in your own heart. Just say, God, I trust you in this moment. I trust you with this season of pain that I'm walking in right now. I trust and believe that as we are walking through it together that I know I will see the glory of God on the other side. God, with these confessions of faith today, will you use it (laughs) Use it tomorrow morning when we wake up and we get back to that place of worry. Remind us that you are in control. God, and and in weeks to come, when something else happens, will you bring us back to this place where we are laying down these moments in trust and faith and belief in you. God, use them in our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I love you guys. I am so, I'm so excited about where God has our church. I'm so excited where God is taking us as a, 
a family of God, a people of God, and really excited. I think uh, the best days of our church are in front of us. Thank you, Quincy, for our continued time that we have uh, together to be challenged and to challenge one another. So um, just very grateful right now. So don't forget, um, I'm going to be calling for volunteers for our big day that we got coming up. You'll see that uh, in the next couple of days. So go ahead and sign up early and often to get those choice assignments. Uh, and yeah, that'll be good. So don't forget when we, when we get that. So Regeneration Church, you belong, you are loved, and you are free. Thanks.